It's kind of like in Willy Wonka and the Chocolate Factory, you know, when she first bites into the truffle. You know, each flavor is very layered and really delivers a pretty complex experience, and that really is a lot of fun for me. You ready? You guys ready? Make sure you say wow, okay? My name is Horacio Garciotto. I'm one of the guys of mozzarella with my son. And we make fresh mozzarella for the city of New York. This is the mozzarella curd. Get a piece of curd like that, do a cut through the guitar, and make them small pieces. Because they have to do this, warm it up with the hot water from the sink. Put some salt, give a little taste. Because every day it's curd is different. Now you guys are ready? Now we've got to come to the big part. From someone like he's been doing for 26 years, so I could say the hardest part is that knowing what's enough water, what's not. Once you put too much hot water in, it messes it up. It's by feeling. You see now they started to melt already? Looks like the water I put it was just right. It's actually unbelievable sometimes how water and a paddle can create something like this because it just became the work of art. Okay, now we're ready for this shot because I pull it up now. Okay, now Carlo will be making the bocconcini and making the mozzarella. The main thing that some people don't understand is, as you can see, we're not wearing gloves. Everything is clean, but there is no way possible that you can make mozzarella with gloves because the mozzarella is so hot, it'll melt the plastic and you can't get the feel of the touch. When art, you sculpt, you design, and you start from scratch on the canvas. So for me, this is an Italian culture of art displayed through food. I have the best job in the world, from 1993 to now. It's 24 years. You feel good when people appreciate what you're doing. They treat me like I'm God, I'm, like, I'm not. I'm just exactly. making myself, let's say. You know, everyone has an idol, right? Some people like Derek Jeter, some people like Carmelo Anthony. Not many people can say like their father's their idol. To see from what he drove in 1993, and to what he drives now, not that it matters, but to see the sacrifice he put in, to see on Christmas he would sleep in the store in the basement just to make the extra mozzarella. People from Italy come here and say, I've never had mozzarella like this in my life. That makes this for me coming here every day satisfying. I'm happy that he's my father. This to me is like a story and a work of art and a canvas that's too beautiful to not keep using as a canvas. That's what makes me hungry and determined to keep this because at the end I feel like as great as this is, there's another chapter and I want to be that person to write that chapter for him when he's done. I'm Nate Hodge, the head chocolate maker and co-founder of Rocka Chocolate, and we're at our chocolate factory in Red Hook, Brooklyn. So the cacao pods are cut open and there's a mixture of fruit surrounding the seeds of the cocoa tree. Those are uh, scooped out and generally put into um, sacks so they can be taken somewhere to be fermented. This is a repurposed juicer. It has a custom casing and set of blades for cracking the cocoa beans. We use them for separating the shell from the nib, like this, just pure nibs. And what we want to do is start to refine this so that we can turn it into gooey, gooey, shiny, rich chocolate. 
These are like Indian spice grinders that are used for chai, curries. These have been repurposed for cocoa. We'll run it overnight and then we'll add sugar in the morning. This is after it's gone through the roller mill behind us. This is gonna get thicker and thicker and thicker, and then eventually you'll start to see like sugar granules coming out, and then the machine will start grinding the solids. You wanna recoat all the particles in fat, and you wanna reshape those particles. So since it's coming through here in a really tight space, it's flattening the particles, and that's great. We want small particles, but what we also want are particles that are rounded into a pearl shape so that it rolls off your palate instead of like sticks to it. So they're gonna run this through three times and by the end, it's just gonna be like a big knot of chocolate. So after the chocolate has been massaged and aerated, um, then we're gonna do this, which is the process of tempering the chocolate. So it's aligning the polymorphic crystals in the fats and the solids so that they all harden at the same temperature. And cocoa bean is roughly 50% cocoa powder, 50% cocoa butter. Because we have 50% essentially a pure fat, we like to play with that fat. Hector's steeping chanterelles in cocoa butter. In the holding tank, we'll add a lot of the other flavoring, deep herbs or teas. We really want that like incredibly silky texture and being able to flavor the butter and then add that back in, it doesn't affect the texture. So then we'll uh, roll the racks into this box. Humidity and chocolate don't mix. So it goes in there at like a dry 55 degrees for the chocolate bars to set perfectly. Rolled out, stacked up over here, put into these white bins. And then this is our wrapping machine. We're doing like 1,600 to 2,000 bars a day.
I don't think of myself as a woman making confectionery. I just like think of myself as making the best solar taffy in the country. It's kind of like in Willy Wonka and the Chocolate Factory, you know, when she first bites into the truffle. You know, each flavor is very layered and really delivers a pretty complex experience, and that really is a lot of fun for me. In Chinese culture, if you ever go to a funeral, they always have some sort of candy, usually like a hard candy. And the idea is that it takes away some of the bitterness of life. I like that idea of let yourself indulge in, in these little relief of reality. When I was little, I was obsessed with candy all the time. Like I used to go to the craft store, and when I found out that like humans actually made candy, I like freaked out and I, I started making stuff as soon as I could. Making silver taffy is super tactile, especially because the way that we make it, each recipe is unique. To be able to get the whole product cooled, we fold it on top of each other so that it will be the same temperature throughout. It's super Goldilocks style, like you just have to be familiar with each recipe to know what it should feel like. And then we wait until it reads about like 98 degrees and then we're able to pull the taffy on the taffy puller. So the whole idea of what the taffy puller is doing is it aerates, pushing air into the product. You know, I used to pull the taffy by hand back in the day. I had seven pound batches, which doesn't really sound like a lot, but after about 15 minutes of pulling by hand, it was exhausting. That's when I bought um, Rosie from a carny somewhere. I can't remember where, where he was, but he was funny. What makes Salty Road so different is that we use real ingredients to flavor the candy. So real vanilla beans, real fruit purees, ground spices, and we use large grain sea salt. So it's sort of a signature crunch. It also brings out the natural flavorings that we use, and it balances the sweetness. With taffy, it's a weird medium because we have to cook it to such a high temperature. So we cook it to 252 degrees. The cooling table has cold water running through the bottom of it, and the top is stainless steel. And so you have to know how it's supposed to feel throughout the entire process. You're taking all these raw ingredients, just like any kind of cooking, or any, any when you make anything. You can call them artists, you can call them makers, you can call them whatever, but some saltwater taffy makers look at our product and they think that because we don't use artificial flavors and colors, it's not actually saltwater taffy, which is not true, but um, you know, people can think whatever they want to. <laughs> as long as it tastes good, I don't really care what they call it. The batch roller just simply turns it into a cylinder and then we'll take the cylinder and hand pull it into Harriet, the, our cutting and wrapping machine. Confectionery is kind of a trip because if you go like old school, it's mostly older white men. For a little bit, I was working with a confectionery scientist who was a, who was a woman and she brought me to some of these like corporate events and they just had no interest in me like at all. We have for the last three years, I think only have, have had women. It's not a philosophy, it's just like we hire the most badass people that we can hire and it just so happens that the, the last three years, it's only been women. I don't think of myself as a woman in like making confectionery. I just like think of myself as making the best solar taffy in the country. Toffee is pretty simple to make. It's hard to make right, even though there's not many ingredients. It's really three things. It's really good quality butter, sugar, and sea salt. That's all that goes in it. I use an 83 or 84% uh, butterfat butter. 
Butter crunch toffee is, uh, again, deceptively simple. You know, you just put the butter in there and the sugar and the salt and start stirring it. But And you have to put it over a really high heat. And it has to be stirred pretty much continuously for the 40 minutes or so that it takes to cook it. I had a little bit of trepidation about kind of breaking into the food industry. I have to say that whenever I'm at an event or, you know, an industry gathering of any sort, hands down I'm always the oldest person in the room because, you know, I came to it pretty late. As an entrepreneur, you really need to do all the things. You really have to do everything from the ground up. That was both challenging, enlightening, and ultimately fun. There's almost no one that doesn't like chocolate and candy. Especially butter crunch toffee is something that folks really have a deep taste memory of, especially here in the US. A lot of people really have a thing for it, so that was always a, a good way to break the ice. Opening Ronnie Sue's, I felt like I wanted to have some kind of little tagline that encapsulated what my philosophy was for my product. I came up with simple on the outside, special on the inside. Put my money where your mouth is, that's another. <laughs> the ingredients and the treatment of those ingredients is really where the special part comes in. It may look deceptively simple on the outside, you know, just a smooth little bonbon, but when you bite into it, it's very special on the inside. I'm Keith Cohen. I'm the owner of All Washers Bakery. We're in one of New York City's oldest and most iconic food establishments. So here we have Isaac and Enrique showing us how we make the bagels every day. Here we have two different types of starters that we use. So we have our natural uh, sourdough starter along with a special biga. It's our bagel biga. After the starters are added to the mixers, we add in the malt and honey. We have flour, water, salt, yeast, Right now we're making a 100 pound mix. This mix here makes 30 dozen bagels. We're mixing and incorporating on a low speed and then developing the gluten more on a higher speed. Our mixer allows the bowl to turn as well so it's a little bit more gentle on the dough. So after it's mixed, okay, almost like working out, right? You've developed gluten, you need to rest. You need to rest in between sets. It's important for us to be very gentle with the dough. We uh, cut the dough into 17 pound increments and let it rest in these buckets. What's gonna happen with the dough is when you first take it out of the bowl, it's gonna feel pretty stiff and hard. By the time it's done resting, you'll feel it relaxed more. Now that the dough is rested, we're gonna bring it over to the hydraulic divider. So this hydraulic divider has probably been around for the past 60, 70 years. Very simple machine, and the more modern ones that we have allow these different grids. The grid will give us 60 even pieces so we can shape later into the bagels. So after it's divided in the divider, we want to put it on our boards and let it rest a bit. So it's going to relax again so we can roll it out correctly. Time is really critical. You cannot be too fast nor too slow because the dough has a mind of its own. You know, heat, humidity, cold will all affect the timing of the final product. Now that we've realized the dough is relaxed and ready to go, it takes a lot of hands, a lot of quick hands, in order to be able to roll this out to be able to put it back on the board so we can give it a final rest before it goes into the refrigerator. When the dough is relaxed, it's a lot easier to flatten out the piece. And from there, you work your hands from the center out in order to develop a, a, a mini baguette. So once you're comfortable with the length of it, the dough will seal and you're ready to put it on the boards. Hand speed is super important. It's inherent in bakers. They need good hand speed just like if you're an athlete. And it takes time. You have to work with your group of bakers in order to develop that pace and also that cadence, just like any good team. So here we have the bagels resting on the boards. Uh, it is critical to leave them out a little bit to give them one little final rest before they go in the refrigerator overnight. In the morning, they pull the bagels out of the refrigerator and then they go into our deck oven. The deck oven is kept somewhere around 450 degrees, and the one key element is making sure we have enough steam in terms of not boiling the bagel. 
Now, people would say that's a sacrilege, and I understand why. The fact that we have steam as opposed to a regular bagel oven that's just dry heat, I thought it could take the place of the boil, and in fact it has. And every five minutes almost, you can see the, the bagel get a little bit bigger. You're going to get this mahogany crust that you won't with a regular boiled bagel. What do I want in a bagel? I want a nice chew. I want flavor. I want somebody to eat it and not go into a food coma. Uh, you can eat it on its own. You can eat it as a sandwich. You can have it as a piece of toast. I think bagels are one of the most universal foods out there. And that is how bagels are made. I'm Chris Harvey and I'm the chocolatier for Ann Sons Chocolates in Beverly Hills, California. Ann Sons makes a variety of modern and classic confections. Probably our most popular flavors at Ann Sons are the Speculus Bonbon, the Lemon Verbena and Yuzu Bonbon. One of our signature bonbons is our Hazelnut Praline and Pop Rock Bonbon. So the first thing I'm gonna do is I'm gonna color the white chocolate. In this case, we're gonna use pink, a little bit more of a rose pink, and a blue. Piping a straight line is very difficult, and in fact, this is piping a straight line into a demisphere, and so I'm gonna pipe the lines in in a straight fashion, but I'm gonna tilt the mold onto a container to kinda of hold it at that angle. So now that our colors are in, it's time to spray the colored cocoa butter into it. And in this case, we're gonna use black, and we first have to temper it, which is taking it down to its working temperature, which is 29 degrees centigrade. And we can spray it into the molds. The cocoa butter sets almost immediately, so we have to work very quickly. And after it's done spraying, we're ready to shell the molds. To shell the chocolate, we take the sprayed mold to the chocolate machine. We flood the cavities with the milk chocolate, scrape off the excess, vibrate it to get any bubbles out of it so it all falls into place. Flip it over to empty the chocolate back into the machine and then we scrape it and clean up the sides and now we're ready to fill it. The Pop Rock Praline filling is a mixture of hazelnut praline paste, hazelnut paste, milk chocolate, cocoa butter, and unflavored Pop Rocks. The Pop Rocks will be protected by the fats so they won't start sizzling until the guest eats it. So once the filling is made, it's time to pipe the center into the shell. And it's all done by hand. It's right at eye level, so they're all measured out correctly. It's about five grams of filling per bonbon. After we fill the shelled bonbon molds, it goes into the cooling cabinet for about 35 or 40 minutes. And then we're ready to put the backs on it. So we warm up the back side to allow the tempered chocolate to adhere to the already set chocolate. Once chocolate is set, wet chocolate will not adhere to it. It'll pull right off. It's allowing it to kind of marry together. At this point, we cap it and we add our monogram logo transfer sheet to it. We scrape off the excess chocolate and now the bonbon mold is ready to go into the cooler. After about 30 minutes, we take it out of the refrigerator. We invert it onto a board and knock it on the back and they should all release. And that is how we make our signature Praline Pop Rock Bonbon at Ann Sons in Beverly Hills, California. One of the things I love about watching our guests eat these is the reaction on their face. They love that sizzle going on. It transports them sometimes to their childhood. And for a new generation of chocolate eaters, it's a whole new experience. We never think it's too early to eat our chocolate. Breakfast, lunch, dinner, chocolate makes people happy. That's what is great about chocolate. It makes everybody happy. Hi, I'm Chef Ezra Sochoa. Today I'm gonna to show you how to make amazing al pastor from start to finish. So 
So al pastor is a way of making tacos. It's one of the most popular tacos I would say in Mexico. It's usually made out of pork and it's layer by layer with different kinds of spices, different kinds of rubs. I think a taqueria is not complete unless you have al pastor tacos. Today we're gonna make my own style. So first off, we're gonna toast all these aromatics. We're gonna toast the cloves, the bay leaf, the cinnamon sticks, the peppercorn under high heat. Rotate it a little bit, mix it up. A lot of the smoke is gonna to start to pop out and that's a good sign that you're on the right track. So we're gonna put these aside. We're gonna to torch our dried chiles. In this case, we're gonna use uh, California dried chile. We're gonna use guajillo. You can deep fry these, you can toast them, you can boil them. In this case, we decided to go with the torch. Give a little extra smoky flavor to it. It's gonna to start to blister a little bit. It's gonna change color. It's gonna to start to uh, become a little crispy and that's a good sign that you're doing it properly. So now we're gonna get all these components, mix in our vinegar, our fresh garlic, our onion, our canned pineapple, and this is a little twist. This is my own version of Al Pastor Taco. We're gonna do use molasses. It goes perfect with this marinade. So we're getting everything together. We're gonna blend it so we have a nice thick paste. So our adobo paste is ready to go. Now I'm gonna grab my meat. Particularly, I love to use pork shoulder and I like to get it about a quarter inch thick. Not too thick, not too thin. I wanna be able to control the fat to the protein ratio. I like to marinate piece by piece because I like to keep track of every individual piece. I kinda of know where the good pieces are at, the little pieces, the trimmings. So now we go on to building our trompo. I love to put a pineapple at the bottom of the base because when I start to trim, the blade of my knife doesn't hit the steel at the bottom. Building a trompo is very labor intensive. It's very physical, it's emotional. It takes me about 45 to an hour. For me personally, it's very relaxing, therapeutic. It's really fun. It's, it's literally like doing a vertical puzzle, if you may. Usually we make a trompo here on Mexicali taco, and that's about a 30 to 40 pounder, depending on the day. Out of that trompo, you can probably get about 300 to 400 tacos. So it's very important that when you're building your trompo al pastor is that you trim as you go. So you're gonna pile it up, you're gonna have these little off the edges trimmings, and you put them in the right little places. You're building your, your puzzle, remember. So it's very important that you trim, you pile, trim, pile, also, the biggest reason too is that if you were to trim everything at the end, you're gonna have a lot of leftover trims and you can't put it inside the trompo anymore. It's too late. I love to finish it off with a piece of pork belly on the top. I score it a little bit to ooze out all the fatness and all the juices out of the pork belly. It waterfalls down and trickles down into the trompo. And that's super important to keep it hydrated. It's a machine and you gotta have it oiled up and really nice. So I'm all finished with my trompo. Now I'm gonna take it to my trompo spit, my vertical grill. We're gonna place it there and I wanna pipe it hot, as high as it goes. Why? Because I wanna torch, I wanna sear every single layer. Um, I wanna get a nice caramelization. You know, the molasses are gonna come through, they're gonna melt, and it's gonna create this crust, combined with the chilies, the fattiness of the pork. Um, and then I'm gonna start shaving. Maybe 20 minutes after the first sear, I start trimming it, giving it a better shape, and then from there on, it's the same process until you finish all of your trompo. Personally, I like to shave my, my pastor off the trompo very thin. Why? Because everybody's favorite part is the crust. The crust is the most flavorful part, so if you shave it really thin, you're gonna have more crust component into each bite of your taco, it's gonna be amazing. We're gonna get a pineapple, we're gonna slice it, and put it directly on the grill. Dust it up with a little bit of sugar, open flame, it's gonna caramelize it, it's gonna give it a different flavor to it. Gonna get it smoky, this little syrup is gonna come out of it, and then you slice it really thin. A proper al pastor taco must have the following. A corn flour tortilla, beautiful thinly sliced, roasted, charred al pastor meat, salsita of course, salsita is super important, guacamole, you gotta have onion, cilantro, and you gotta finish it with that pineapple as your final touch on your al pastor taco. You're gonna have sweetness to it, spiciness, smokiness from the meat, fattiness, sourness from a little squeeze of lime at the very end. All the components are coming together to make a magical bite. And that is how Al Pastor is made.
Hi, my name is Elizabeth DiPrinzio of Earth and Element, and I'm a Los Angeles based ceramicist. Earth and Element is a ceramic studio, and we're inspired by nature, and we try and bring those elements into your home. We create colorful, functional, day-to-day -day use tableware. It's a really beautiful relationship between food and plating. You have your plate that you've made with your bare hands, and you've created this beautiful meal with your hands, and you combine the two, and it just makes the experience so much more beautiful and organic. The way we make our plates is we roll out a large piece of slab. We then take our plate template and we cut out our plates. We then take the clay and we throw it down on our plate mold. From there, we bring down our jigger arm and the jigger arm has a profile tool connected to it. So once you pull it down, it actually starts molding and shaping the plate. From there, we adjust the plate a little bit. We put it out in the sun to dry for 30 minutes. So first when I'm making a cup is I measure out my clay. And usually with my cups, I measure out about a pound. From there, I throw the clay on the wheel. I wet my hands, I wet the piece, and I just get to work. The first thing you wanna do is cone your piece up. So when you're coning, it looks like a little cone, and we're doing that just to get all those weird little air bubbles out. So once you do that a few times, you then bring the cone down into this little birthday cake is what we like to call it. Take your two thumbs, insert it into the middle of the piece, and you're gonna start pulling the walls out and creating your bottom of the cup. From there, you're gonna start pulling the walls up and this is what gives the cup its height. I then cut out all my little moons and I attach those moons one by one by hand. What we use is we call it slip, and it's basically, it's like the potter's glue. What's so important about a mug is people start to get attached to their mugs, and it becomes their everyday mug, and it becomes their morning ritual, and it's how they start their day. With a bowl, you really want to make sure that the shape is something that's easy for someone to hold and easy to eat out of. I really try and make sure that the bowl is really round and then it feels good in my hands. Trimming is basically cleaning the edges and the rim of either a bowl or a plate just so that it's smooth and it doesn't scratch. Once bone dry, it gets fired for the first time. When we fire, that's at around 1800 degrees, and it becomes what we call bisquares. Bisquare is fired pottery that is ready for glazing. Once the bisquare comes out of the fire, we sand the piece, we put it back on the wheel, and we wax parts of the plates and parts of the pieces that we don't want glaze to touch. So that would be the bottom of cups, the rim of a plate, and the rims of bowls. After the pieces are waxed, we then mix our glaze and we have all of our colors in each of their own glaze bucket and we mix each one just to make sure all those elements and compounds are mixed well together and then it gives one beautiful coat to a piece. A lot of our plates and our cups have this striped design, so we keep that design going and we dip half the plate. We let that dry, then we dip the other side, and it creates like this stripe in the middle of all of our plates and bowls. 
What's so special about a plate is it's almost the canvas for a painter, especially when we're dealing and working with chefs and designing for their restaurant and what they're cooking. They're playing with colors, they're playing with textures. So for them, it's also really important to have something that's just as beautiful and looks well with what they're making and what they're cooking. Once we have everything glazed, it enters the kiln and we fire at 2200 degrees. It'll fire for about 12 hours overnight and then the next day we let it sit for about five hours to cool down. Once it reaches around two, 300 degrees, we start like peaking and taking pieces out. So the clay is called speckled buff clay, and those pop up during the glaze firing. You can't see them during greenware or even bisqueware. You see the final product once it comes out of the glaze. After we take those fired pieces out, we have to sand every single piece, make sure the bottom is smooth, that way it doesn't scratch the surface of somebody's table. From there, we pack it and we ship it out to our customers. What makes us unique from other pottery studios is our colors. We're not afraid to color outside the lines and redefine what tableware should look like. Some people have a relationship with their food, they have a relationship with their favorite sweater, and I think there are a lot of foodies and chefs and people like me that have a relationship with their tableware and their favorite cup. A cup, a bowl, a plate, to me, is something that you use every single day. What we drink and eat from is really important. It's how we start our day. It becomes part of your day-to-day -day ritual. And so I think it's really important to love what you eat off of. That's the best part of this whole thing, is bringing joy to other people. I'm Keith Cohen, I'm the owner of All Washers Bakery. We're in one of New York City's oldest and most iconic food establishments. And this is how we make our croissants. I want to take this opportunity to introduce Youssef. He is our croissant master. Here in our giant mixer, we're gonna add flour, milk, salt, sugar, milk powder. He adds milk powder because it adds, it's dehydrated, so it's, it acts more as a solid. When we first met Yusef, we tasted this croissant. So when you look at it and you taste it, you don't change his recipe. Yeast, water. Ice water is very important, especially during the summer. It brings the mixed temperature down. So you don't want too hot of a dough because what's gonna happen is A, the dough is gonna proof, but more importantly, your butter is gonna start to break down. And finally, butter. We source our butter from France. Every country has their own terroir. Because butter is so integral to the taste of the croissant, we felt it necessary. Once the dough is mixed, we want to be able to pull it out and chunk it into six kilo increments. Much like a lot what we do here, there's a resting period. Pre-shape gives strength. This is one of the critical things, almost like bread, is you have to give strength to your dough. In order to pre-shape it, you want to make sure you're gentle with the dough. You want to fold it under itself without damaging it too much. That dough has to have that stretch and that shine. When we talk about letting the dough proof or rest, you'll also see about a doubling in the size of the volume. You're going to punch the dough down. After it's doubled in size, it's going to give it a time to deflate. You'll take a little bit out of the gas. It will tighten up on you a little bit, and it'll be ready for the freezing process. During the freezing process, because we're not doing blast freezing, the dough is still fermenting, which is also very important. One of the keys to croissants are there's not only butter in the dough, but there's butter that gets laminated into the dough. So you're putting dough with butter sandwiched, and then you are passing it through a sheeter, which stretches out the dough and makes it a little bit thinner. Again, what you're looking for is that layered effect. The way you're able to do that is through folding the dough again and then turning it. So it becomes exponential. Don't hold me to my math, but once you have four layers, your next set, you will probably have somewhere around 16 layers. And the sign of a good croissant is you should be able to see the laminates. Once it's finalized sheeting, it's now ready for cutting. So we have to have a 10-foot table now so we can lay out the entire sheet. And again, it is about the timing. 
so we're able to cut it quickly. After it gets cut into strips, it now has to be cut on the angle so you can get that beautiful triangle. The shape of our croissants aren't crescent, they are oblong. Youssef has developed, I believe, is somewhat his own technique of taking the croissant and giving it a little bit of a stretch. And with each little stretch or each little pat that you see it does, it gives a, a little bit extra so you get an extra roll. And at the same time, it gives it a little bit more strength. So in addition to our regular croissant, we do a pan au chocolat. It's a little bit easier to roll, but again, there is a technique, the way we use the chocolate batons and making sure that it's rolled tight enough so they don't melt when they're baked. Once again here, temperature is working against us. Once we're done rolling the particular sheet, whether it's a plain croissant or a pan au chocolat, we're going to put it right back in the freezer. The proofing stage is a highly critical stage for croissants. Things that get overproofed could have a tendency to collapse in the oven and or uh, one of the key indicators is the butter coming out of the product. The egg wash gives a nice shine to it. it it's more aesthetics. We bake our croissants off at 350 degrees in a confection oven. What's happening now, now that the heat is starting to bake the croissant, again, you are getting some oven spring to it. You are developing that beautiful honeycomb interior. The butter is starting to melt throughout the product, not completely out of the product, but into the product itself. And again, through the Malliard reaction, you're getting a beautiful crisp crust to it. Best time to enjoy a croissant is when it's room temperature. You're allowing the butter to get reabsorbed into it and allow some of the gas to escape. It's very important to achieve all your full flavors after the product reaches room temperature. When you cut it open, you'll see this beautiful honeycomb interior. And that is really one of the keys to a great croissant. On a well-baked croissant, you should have a beautiful crackle to the crust and you should have a soft, and supple interior, and the butter, if it's high quality, should taste very, very neutral. To me, croissants are the epitome of French baking, and that is how croissants are made. Hi, I'm Paul Hakimian. I'm with honeylove.org. I'm one of the directors, and I'm gonna show you how to make honey from my backyard. So I'm with honeylove.org. We're an urban beekeeping nonprofit, and what we do is we educate the public that honeybees are safe. We mentor people to become beekeepers, and so we're basically the voice of the bees. What does a beekeeper mean? Well, it means you have to go out and buy a bee suit, you get the gloves, you get the hive tool, you get the bee brush, and you get a smoker. Those are the tools that you need to become a beekeeper. The reason I use smoke is it masks the smell of the pheromones of bees. When bees actually sting, they give off a pheromone that smells like rotten banana. So when a bee stings you and it gives off that pheromone, it gives off a signal to all the other bees to go attack that area. So it's an alarm. And what we're doing is we're masking the alarm and when you smoke them, they think the house is on fire and they're gonna go and they're gonna start drinking honey and their bellies get full and they can't stink. So they're gonna be focused on getting the honey and drinking the honey opposed to bothering you. Being a beekeeper is actually just managing the growth of the hive. So all you have to do is make sure the bees have enough room to grow and that's the secret. And as they grow, you add another box and another box. Honey is bee food, and you don't want to take their food from them unless it's in excess. So what I tend to do is I'll go into my hives in my backyard, and I'll take one or two or three frames out of the hive, so I'm not depleting their whole honey supply. When you become a beekeeper, what you have to do is every four to six weeks, you open up the hive and you do hive inspections. And what I'm looking for, growth. I'm looking for the brood, the baby bees and the larva. You wanna make sure that the queen is laying eggs. And if the queen is laying eggs, that means there's a healthy queen, the hive's growing. And what I'm looking for is the honey. Are they producing honey? Are they making honey? They're called worker bees for a reason, right? They work and work and work and they produce, one bee only produces one twelfth of a teaspoon. They'll fly back and forth anywhere from three to five miles 
to get a nectar. First, they go get the nectar and they store it in their honey stomachs. They have these little pouches called honey stomachs. And they come back to the hive and they regurgitate it from their these little straw, you know, tongues that they have, and they give it to the other bees, and they take that nectar and they put it into the cells. And what they do is they fan and evaporate the water content, and then you're left with honey. So that's how honey is made. So I open up the hive, and when I'm taking get looking for the honey, I need to get the bees off of it. So I'm gonna lift up the hives and I can do one of two things. I can, you know, kind of give it a good shake, which you know, works really well and they come off, but if they're, if they're really hanging on, you can get a bee brush and just brush them lightly off and they'll fall off. Once we get the, the frames inside the kitchen, what we do is we're gonna put them on a cookie sheet so you're not making a mess, and you're gonna take a knife and you're gonna just cut the wax uh, and the frame all the way around. You're just gonna just draw a line around the square frame. You're gonna cut, cut it out and you're left with a big block of honey and wax. And from there, I'm gonna take a fork and I'm just gonna decap it, right? I'm just gonna take that first layer off. And what that does is it kind of opens it up and it makes it easier for it to crush and strain. So when I'm in there, it'll just make it easier for me. So we're just gonna kind of rake a fork over the top of it, open them up both sides, cut it up, throw it into your bowl, and then all I'm gonna do is just crush and strain it. I'm just gonna churn it, churn, 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 crush, 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 and once I do that, it almost liquefies, and once it liquefies, you're ready to filter the, or the honey out of the wax. And you do that by the weight, the weight of the honey, after it's strained, at the very bottom, you have a little, uh, you know, a little spout, and all you do is just put your jar there, and we're gonna fill it up with honey. And that's it, it goes from the hive, crush and strain to the jar. This is how honey is made in my backyard. Hi, I'm Sarah Hendricks and this is our little dream shop, Lady and Larder. We are a small, actually tiny cheese shop based here in Los Angeles, California and we specialize in cheese and cured meat boards. We serve it with an, an array of fresh seasonal produce, dried fruit, nuts, olives, cornichons. We've always found that what's in season is what tastes best. The foundation of all great cheese boards is always the products you choose to put on it. So you always want to select a couple of cheeses. We work in odd numbers. We find those are visually pleasing. You always want to have a variety of texture and flavor. We always recommend getting something that's a safe bet for your crowd, which for most people is a good solid cheddar. Made with cow's milk, everyone loves cheddar, it's always a win. And then once you get your cheddar, you can add a couple more adventurous options like a funky blue cheese or a creamy goat cheese or even a sheep's milk cheese. Once you have your cheeses down, then you're gonna lay your cured meats. When selecting your meats, we go with the same golden rule, variety, taste, and texture. Get a couple of different size formats, larger, smaller, spicy, different flavor profiles, and then you'll have an array of items on the board once you get everything put together. Instead of laying all of your meats flat on the board, we like to take larger ones and fold them in a variety of different ways, which I'm gonna show you right now. With Prosciutto, our larger cured meats, we like to make a little bit of what we call like a ribbon. And we run those just down the middle of the board, always keeping them airy and light and not too compacted. Next, when you're laying the smaller circular format salami, we lay the tiniest ones flat and overlapped, just like so, around the edges. They create a great border for your, for your platters or boards. And then with the stuff that's medium or large in size, is we like to fold those in a couple of different ways. The first way I'm going to show you is just like a deck of cards. You fold them in half and arrange them in your hand like you're holding a hand of cards in a poker game. Another way that I'm going to fold meats today is here like a flower. You fold them in half and then in half again, being careful not to squish them together too much so that again they stay nice and airy and light. We're going to take all of the negative open space in the middle of the board and add the rest of the accoutrements. Accoutrements are all those delicious little things that pair well with your cheeses and meats. So your fruit, your nuts, your olives. And when it comes to laying out the accoutrements, we like to place things that pair well together near each other. Once the fresh fruit is laid, 
Then we do the dried fruit followed by the nuts. Be sure not to put rolly things like olives and nuts at the edges so that when you're transferring it, they don't roll off. Once you have your board just how you want it, then you finish it with final touches and garnishes. Go ahead and head over to the herb section at your grocery store and grab flowering rosemary or thyme or edible flowers. Just make sure that everything that you place on your board is edible and safe to eat. Here at Lady & Larder, our signature garnish is usually a bit of wild chamomile. We love chamomile because it adds an extra whimsy touch when garnishing the boards. We have a golden cheese rule, and that is that you should always serve your cheese and cured meats at room temperature. So if you're getting ready to entertain at 6, pull your board out at 5 o'clock so that it has an hour to come up to room temp. And here we are, the finished board. If you are ever worried about getting invited back to an event or party, we recommend bringing one of these. This board will be the showstopper at Friendsgiving, game night, or any of your holiday events this year. Another one of our favorite things to make at the shop are cakes made out of cheese. You heard it, cheesecakes. People love to order these for their birthdays, gifts, weddings, baby showers, all of their big events. If you don't have a big sweet tooth, this is the cake for you. The most important part of selecting cheese for a cheesecake is that you select cheeses of different sizes. You want to ensure that the tiers get smaller as you build upwards. We recommend using Bloomy Rhine softer cheeses. Those ones are all easy to break down and serve at home. Now for the fun part. We get to add all of the seasonal garnishes and fresh honeycomb. Right now it's fall, so we're going to be using a variety of different things we found at the farmer's market, including miniature apples, pomegranate, figs, and golden raspberries. Other options at different times of year include things like fresh citrus, viola flowers, you name it. Every time of year there's something special that you can use to garnish a cheesecake. We love making these cakes because they bring joy to any celebration. Remember, there's no wrong way to do this. Just relax, have fun, and enjoy sharing these with your friends and family. When people think of tofu, they think of bland, weird, boring. It's just this block that comes in a box. But tofu can be so much more than that. My name is Paul Ng. I'm the owner of Fang An Tofu Shop. My family business has been around since 1933, and ultimately making tofu is my life now. We make about 500 pounds of tofu a day. I guess I'm lucky that I make the stuff that I love to eat. When I took over the family business, uh, I had no knowledge of making tofu. There was lots of trial and error, you know. Even, even now I have trial and error, because I'm still trying to perfect it. Making tofu is like making cheese, except that you have to make the soy milk first. Fresh tofu is made out of two ingredients, soybeans and water. Tofu making is easy and hard at the same time. It's hard to make it taste good unless you put your heart and soul into it. Beans go into the grinder and water's going through it, so soy milk comes out one spout while the pulp comes out another spout. So we go through hundreds of pounds of soybeans a day. It's heavy stuff, so it requires at least two people to make. When the pulp comes out, it comes into a tank where there's already water in it so that we can sort of give it more water to extract more soy milk. That pulp needs to be reground on the next grinder. So the goal in doing that is just to be more efficient in extracting soy milk and getting as much as we can. Back when my grandfather started the business, they hand ground the soybeans using a stone grinder that they would turn in a circle around and around. And now when we make tofu compared to back then, uh, we can make tofu a hundred times faster. During the process, I, I check with a refractometer. A refractometer measures the amount of solids in water. I want to make sure that the quality of the soy milk is at its peak. Now, not necessarily having really strong soy milk means having great tofu. It has to be the right level of soy milk. So when the soy milk gets pumped out, it looks like a, a bubble bath. And I suppose, you know, sitting in a pool of soy milk, but you know, that's maybe 
better left unsaid. There's a lot of foam in the production of uh, soy milk, and I don't want any of it to go to waste because there's potential in all this stuff. So we scoop up the foam into buckets and then we load it into the cooking vat just so that we get every last drop of the soybean. Soy milk in its raw condition cannot be uh, consumed. Raw soy milk is not digestible. Back in the day, my grandfather used to cook soy milk in a big wok. I mean, it would take forever since uh, you know, it was this huge wok in a small flame. It took three hours to get soy milk to boil. Compared to what we do now, it takes it about 15 minutes. Good soy milk is the key to making good tofu. Soy milk is the basic essence of all soy products that you would see. So you can make tofu out of it, hard or soft. You can make drinking soy milk out of it. You can make tofu pudding out of it. It's just the essence of all of it. And the key is if it's good. The difference between the tofu pudding and tofu blocks, it's the same process, the same coagulant, the same everything. A coagulant is something that turns it into curds, like much like you would make cheese. And you break it up. So the process of breaking up and making tofu, this part is still essentially the same as it was, has it ever been for thousands of years. Imagine taking over a tofu business and having no knowledge of how to make tofu. I had to ask family members, but family members' recollection of the recipes and how to make stuff was kind of fuzzy. They would say a cup of this or a spoon of that. I decided to have certain family members do the physical process in front of me to show me how to do it and even they couldn't do it. People always constantly talk about tradition versus modern technology. Recreating the recipes at home in a small setting versus a production level is quite different. When people think of machines, they think that it's an automated system, but it's not. It's quite still mechanical. The machines, at least the, what we use. Uh, so it requires a person to, to make sure that the quality of the soy milk coming out that makes the tofu is good the strength of it, how much water they were asking, uh, how fine the grind is. All this is why it's important that the person who makes the tofu cares about it. I'm the type of person who, if I do something, I have to care about it. If I don't care about it, then I shouldn't do it. There were many things that I didn't quite like about the old business. Basically, there were lots of pitfalls in the technology at the time. The press that we use is a pneumatic press, and it gives exactly precisely 75 pounds of pressure. Back in the old days, they used anything and everything they could possibly use to press the tofu. Well, it was either bricks, rocks, or sacks of rice. Now we use fabricated molds, especially made for tofu making. But back in the day when my grandfather was making it, they used whatever they could, and most often it was a soda crate. The soda crate had exactly the precise squares necessary to make tofu. Soda crates were made out of wood. And obviously, after a while with water and everything, wood warped. It wasn't that long where they would have to replace it pretty constantly. It took quite a while to get like 100 blocks of tofu because they were literally pressing one block of tofu at a time. Now, to make 100 blocks of tofu would probably take 20 minutes. The person who's making the tofu is important because they're the person who decides whether that consistency was good or it was done right. It makes a world of a difference. You have firm tofu, you have soft tofu. How firm, how soft is the person making it? Tofu is a blank slate. You know, you can do whatever you want. The difference between the person who really loves making tofu and just the worker doing it is that tofu is going to taste better to the person eating the tofu. My kids actually love the tofu pudding. Well, one kid loves it. There's always the hater. With the tofu pudding, we want a very smooth, delicate texture. You don't disturb. You just pour and let it sit and form. It's still quite traditional in how it's made. When we scoop the tofu pudding in front of people, it's the traditional way of serving it. You look in and you see the tofu pudding. It's literally being scooped for them like, like ice cream. 
The act of scooping for someone is almost like a performance. There is a way of doing it. It's not just any old way. You have to scoop it in thin little layers or else you would create too much water from scooping too deeply. Tofu pudding eaten the traditional way, at least for us, is just the tofu pudding with a brown sugar syrup on top. In Chinese, it's called the tofu flour, you know, like something delicate. My family business has been around for 87 years, since 1933. There was obviously immense family pressure. How to be and what to do and the products to make. They were really looking for me to extend the legacy of the family business. Making tofu is my life now. Sometimes it's lost on me on why I'm doing this. You know, running the family business and carrying the tradition of making tofu is a real challenging and difficult path. Yeah, I mean, I question myself, why do I do this day after day? To make my family proud? Mm, sort of. So to make great tofu? Yeah, possibly. But the biggest reason I do this is to support my kids and my family.